Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com. S T R E N G T H G U I L D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the per- first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Uh, this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. I'm a powerlifter, Highland Games athlete, and just, oh, man, I'll compete in about anything, except for running. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, is Dr. Mike Nelson, uh, credited with Flex Diet Cert, associate professor at the Keurig Institute. So I'll be actually teaching for them uh, starting in January for the new cohort for their clinical neuroscience program. So I'm pretty excited about that. And still hanging out at home for at least a little while. Yeah. In fact, that's a little bit of a theme. We are, everybody, before we hit the record button, we were just kind of, you know, lamenting that so many of the studies that are coming across my desk, at least, are, they're observational, you know, they're, they're not interventions, they're not experimental models where you're feeding someone something and then waiting to see what happens. It's all this kind of loose association with less control. And yeah, and I, I guess it wasn't dawning on me at the time. I'm fussing it, right? But Mike and Phil, you guys are like, <laughs> everybody's, you know, stopped doing research data collection. So all you can yeah. do is dig through databases, you know. Yeah. Just... I do think it will force people. I know, like, uh, some stuff from Dr. Andrew Huberman's lab. They're doing some stuff with at-home testing now and finding ways of doing more almost remote-type studies. So I think that'll be a interesting area, and hopefully we'll – may actually be even better than some in-person studies but i agree with some stuff you're, there's just no way to to get around having good nice controlled in-person studies yeah we yeah. do use portable equipment i mean simple you know glucometers glycated hemoglobin um hrv you know this is stuff that mm-hmm. we can send people home with uh, you are it does increase the on the the burden on you i think to make sure that they're doing it right you know like train oh, yeah. train them up but Okay, um, let we have a, a show of m- mail, um, questions, comments, a little bit of science news, like I said, more on the, um, you know, reviews and observational front, but uh, let me start with two just nice ones that I got. The, Rob still sends me emails. You guys have been around since the beginning. Rob's, he's alive. He's alive. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talked to him on the way home, and, he, you know, he's just... He's just Rob. <laughs> you, <laughs> anybody who remembers Rob's, but he sends me this yeah. stuff all the time. So um, this is a nice one from uh, Kelsey. She says, good morning, everyone. I'm a longtime listener, big fan, recently a paying uh, patron. I decided it was time to give back to the podcast that it does more for this field than any of the others I've tried listening to. Uh, I also participated in the giveaway for the T-shirt by commenting on um, – Let's see, on the bacon jerky taste test, uh, as well as leaving a review on iTunes. I just want to reach out and say, hey, thanks for all the great work and the continued inspiration. I've been in the iron game for about a decade, uh, decade and a half, and, and now as a coach and at various levels, and I thoroughly appreciate your take on things. As I head into my 40s now, you are all showing me the way to become King Conan myself. So I thought that was good. We were talking, of course, a couple of weeks ago about how your motivation changes a little bit, right? From the the young warrior to more like the veteran King Conan, war-scarred veteran thing. So I can appreciate that. Uh, Daniel 
sent us something, and he says, uh, Hi, guys. Your show is incredible. I want to tell you I love the episode you did with Sarah Campbell on gut and performance. So that was a while ago. Um, yeah. About a year, I think, maybe. Uh, especially the part where Sarah discussed the types of gut microbes uh, which listeners should consider, uh, time frames and expectations. It was an eye-opener for me. Uh, I'm sure you know that one of the major causes of hormonal imbalance and poor gut health is the food we consume, uh, mainly the chemicals present in our food, and they do more harm to our gut and overall health than anything. And then he goes on and says a couple of other nice things. So thank you for that, thank Daniel. You. Also cool. Um, Mike, you said you, since she just mentioned, uh, Kelsey mentioned some things on YouTube. Um, what are people saying on YouTube? <laughs> oh, we had some good comments on the last one here. On uh, if people want to look it up, it's the title is Iron Radio Reviews Number Four Bacon Jerky Taste Test. Uh, just a couple of the comments. Michael B said jerky is one of my favorite snacks. When I stop at a gas station, I'll give it a go. Uh, Gabriella said this is amazing. After listening uh, to the boys for so many years, I love putting a face to their voices. We listen to them. I've learned so much from each of them. Each and every show is informational and fun. Keep up the great work. Sounds very sweet. I like those ones, right? When the people are like, oh, my God, I saw your faces. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of drives with the next one here was the anabolic 2K1. Having pretty smiley Michelle on also helps with the visual effects on the video. No <laughs> offense, guys. <laughs> no, none taken. We, we know that. <laughs> yes. Uh, love these. Keep up the great work. I've listened to the podcast for over many years. Great to see the new format. Well done, team. Love the reviews. Another outstanding, clear, and concise review. Uh, Kelsey had, let's see, Phil's going with the Wolverine chops. Nice move, Elder One. <laughs> <laughs> if you like, if you just uh, make bacon in the oven, it's halfway to being jerky. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. Uh, I'll give this a try. Uh, thanks for these guys. Great new content. So yeah, we even had a bunch more after that. So quite a few. That's that's good. Yeah, I noticed yeah. because we don't really push the YouTube side of thing except for over the years. That is, except as a backup. You know, um, yeah, it's nice to do that. Like our first one on the protein donuts. You know, it's got I don't know over four hundred views. That's not a lot on YouTube, but it's more than our usual audio stuff gets because again, we're just kind of backing up and on YouTube, you know, not really advertising or anything. But yeah, it kind of I think it dawned on me at least when we before we started doing those actual videos is that maybe we should put something visual on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Instead of just <laughs> just audio. <clears throat> Throwing the audio back up, up there. Oh, so uh that's good. Uh, if we pan around the internet, uh, Phil, what about like um, you said there were a few things on Facebook cropping up? Yeah, we got a couple of things on here. Um, let's start off with a shorter one. We got Michael wrote in about casein protein. So he's wondering if there are any studies. Let me cite him here exactly. Is there any research on casein if it's more steady? Any. Uh, satiating than whey protein i can usually find deals on whey but not so much on casing i'm wondering if it's worth the extra expense during the diet phase he's doing so i know michael he's 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 trying to drop some some pounds right now I'm wondering if if maybe casing will help him not be as hungry during this stuff mm. and i kind of directed him i mean what i always point to with people is you know, just think about cottage cheese um it's the curds in the way. It's the curdled part is the casing. So, I mean, in, in a sense, you would think it would. Because we all know, I mean, it's pretty much common knowledge at this point that whey is fast digested, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And casing slower. So, I mean, in a sense, one would think it may not be that long, but one would think that you're not going to be hung hungry as fast. It's going to take a little longer to leave your gut. Um, so, I don't know about hours. I mean... Compared to like a steak, <laughs> you know, that's generally what I always pe point people to. It's like, yeah, just eat some meat and don't chew as much. And it's probably going to send your stomach longer. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, that's yeah, true. But uh, it, I mean, yeah, just whatever it's going to take. And 
I mean, but what do you guys think? You're the experts. You know, uh, I just pulled a paper, effective milk protein intake and casein to whey ratio uh, on postprandial glucose, satiety ratings, and subsequent meal intake. How about that? So um, I would point him to that one, Phil. I can send you the link. It's Kung, okay. K-U-N-G, and colleagues. It's, uh, it's from the Journal of Dairy Science in 2018. Um, I'm just reading this for the first time here in front of me. I, Mike, you do this all the time. You pull up. A, yeah, I got one here too. <laughs> uh, whey and casein proteins differentially affect postprandial blood glucose and satiety. So sense of fullness. Um, I think they're talking about its relationship to diabetes. It says, we found no differences between all treatments on pre-lunch appetite change from baseline and total area under the curve. Uh, or lunch meal food intake in terms of protein concentration results. High protein treatments contrasted with normal protein treatments as far as blood glucose changes from baseline, etc. and post-lunch appetite. Protein ratio showed a modest effect in that modified 40 to 60 protein ratio lowered pre-lunch blood glucose changes, etc. What's their ultimate conclusion? High-carbohydrate breakfast meals with increased protein concentration could be a dietary strategy for the attenuation of blood glucose and improved satiety after the second meal. Well, that's just more protein in general, right? Yeah. I don't think you're going to see a ton of difference fast versus slow. I mean, yeah, casein's going to clot in your gut more than whey, but what did you find, Mike? Uh, I found one here, uh, comparative effects of whey and casein proteins on satiety. Uh, this is done in overweight and obese individuals, though. However, it's a randomized controlled trial. Uh, European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 2014, from S. Paul, P-A-L. Um, so they're talking about here the background of different amounts of protein. So what they did is they used a randomized parallel design, a 12-week long study. We had 70 subjects. Uh, with a body mass index between 25 and 40, although I would say that's probably more on the fat mass side than most lifters with the BMI <laughs> in that range. Uh, they had them split into three groups, a glucose control, a casein group, and a whey protein group. They did a VAS, a visual analog scale, looking at week six and then 12. And if you kind of Skip to the conclusion, which is always dangerous to do from an abstract, but uh, collectively weight protein supplementation appears to have a positive and acute postprandial effect on satiety and fullness compared with casein and carbohydrate supplementation in overweight and obese individuals. So this would say that maybe whey protein is a little bit better. I'm not sure exactly how, how much better, and it looks like they only assessed it at 6 in 12 weeks also so there may be some other little interesting things you may find when you pull the full study um and the guys who do mass so monthly applications in sports science uh dr eric trexler had a really cool article in the october issue of uh satiety and protein effects and he did a really good job of breaking down the acute effects we know that protein generally helps um long-term effects however yeah Maybe there's some habituation. You know, if you've been at a high protein level for a while, maybe you need to go a little bit higher. Um, so I think the general conclusion, at least my interpretation of his article, is that it's definitely helpful. Eh, is it as helpful as what most people think? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But again, then you get into the weeds of everyone's going to respond a little bit different. I mean, if I had some clients who had 40 grams of casein, they feel stuffed. And other clients are like, yeah. Wasn't didn't, didn't seem to phase them at all, really. Mm -hmm. But there may be individual differences. And then in research, uh, we talked about this in the protein book, Lonnie, because I had to do the chapter on protein satiety, is how they look at it is completely different, too. You know, are you just rating how full you feel on a visual analog scale? Mm -hmm. Are you pulling any mechanistic data to look at, you know, ghrelin, CCK, insulin, a whole bunch of tons of different hormones? Sometimes they'll give someone a pre-meal and then give them ad libido access to like a buffet and measure how much they actually ate after. I think that's probably a better way of doing it acutely. But obviously doing that in a chronic sense gets to be quite tricky. So, yeah, like all things, starts out kind of simple. I think more protein is better. 
try and casein, probably going to be a good idea in terms of an absolute answer from research. Eh, it's probably mixed. Yeah. There's so many practical things. You know, are you mixing, are you, are you making this with like just tap water? What's the temperature of the tap water for God's sake? Because that affects gastric emptying. Yep. Um, you know, are, are you making it with whole milk That's or heavy whipping cream? That's going to change the yeah. scenario a little bit. Yeah, you what know. you're mixing it with, right? If you're having a meal and you know, now you've got fiber in there and other things. and That's right. I think a lot of us probably do that, right? You throw in, yeah, I'll purposely put some Benefiber or something in there, or sometimes I'll put peanut butter versus berries. It's hard to make sweeping conclusions. It's, it's so true. Uh, I think what we're both saying, though, is higher protein breakfasts are more satiating, and we've known that for a while. Um, I think that's kind of what this Kong paper is saying as well. And kind of what you're saying there too, with yeah. with probably more modest differences, but whether the from the protein type, right? Um, I'd I'd hate to state the obvious, but that's kind of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking to lose fat, at some point you're going to be hungry. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's just part of the deal as well. <laughs> And that's something people have to get get around. Like everybody wants something, and I'm not saying Michael does. This is for the greater good of people, but because uh, I know Mike. But um, yeah, no, there seems to be a whole class of people like, oh, I, I want to lose weight so bad, but God, I'm just hungry. Yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're trying to change your body and make it go down. So everybody wants wants what they want without having to give anything up. Right. And it's like, uh, you know, well, that's part of the deal, guys. Yeah, Let's you know, what were it. you guys... You, you chose and, the goal. Both you guys were just saying last week, like, you want something, but have you considered the cost? Exactly. You know. You know. And yeah, and you're going to be hungry. For me, it was especially at night, and that sucks. Like, yeah, yeah. It is funny, though. I think after several weeks, whether your gut microbiome catches up and evens out in some way something happens and it or maybe it's just psychological it get, does get a little easier but it's never fun to be hungry no and that's like the only time it's fun to be hungry for me is like when i'm just got done with meat prep and it's like oh i'm hungry because i'm not <laughs> cramming myself anymore it's like it's almost i want it <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, oh, that feels good right i'm not full all the time I actually want to eat. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that grows old quickly. So <laughs> either or, you know, being packed full or being hungry all the time. It, it, yeah, it gets old. It's just something you got to deal with. And that's, you know, one place I'm at in life is just the last, no, since it's been almost a year now. My last meet was November and I'm just kind of eating and it's nice. <laughs> you know? It's normal. I'm not, I'm not going up or down. It's like, hey, dude, I'm, I'm going to be 45. I'm still lifting. I'm happy. I'm not worried about where I'm at going up and down. I'm just, let's just see where I end up. So yeah. as long as I'm not a big blubbering mass or a twink, then I'm okay. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's one thing I check in with clients a fair amount, especially if I know I'm kind of putting them close to poverty macros and stuff too, is like, how hungry are you? You know, because it, and sometimes there's things you can change. You can do all sorts of little tricks and stuff like that that can help. But yeah, Sometimes if you're trying to get really, really lean and you're on a time frame, like, you know, Lonnie, you know, Phil, that yep. the answer is, yeah, you deal with it. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. They're not going to change the date of that high school reunion. You know? You're just going to be hungry. <laughs> yep. so. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want people to think that you have to be starving and your your life is miserable all the time. You're just... When you're hungry, at least in bodybuilding, it's like, well, then have another chicken breast and some more broccoli. You know, mm -hmm. enjoy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But but you're not going to get um you know, Twinkies and ho hos. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's one thing I do like about. I just did a longer fast again yesterday, and it is kind of a nice reminder of how much of hunger is, I think, just habit and <laughs> mental side. Because I got up in the morning and I like, okay, I'm going to do a longer fast today. And also I've been playing around to see how fast I can change body weight on the scale just for giggles, basically. Um, and initially my brain's like, oh, breakfast. You should eat now. Don't you want oatmeal? There's cookies in the fridge. You know, it's like normally I don't even eat at that time in the morning. <clears throat> but just the thought of I'm going to try to not eat for a period of time. Mm -hmm. You go through those couple hours where your brain is like, no, you're supposed to eat now. 
and you know physiologically you're going to be fine. Like nothing bad's going to happen. Right, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it's just interesting to get those kind of reminders and realize, oh, because your body thinks possibly it may starve. On yeah. some level, it's like, hey, you're supposed to eat. You need food. We don't know when we're going to get more food. Hey, food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have access to this. Let's get it. Yeah, it's yeah. right there. That's what people forget that. You know, we're literally just wired to to, to live. Yeah. <laughs> you know? oh, your body's going to tell you to eat, eat when you have a chance. Because at one point in time, we had to. Like, every time you had a chance to eat something, you did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it was scarce. <laughs> you know? And we're not that far removed from that time. Right. We're so, hardwired, yeah. Yeah. Because you have access to food. It's like right mm-hmm. there. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yep. And, you know, in some ways, if it's naughty, it, it, again, it's that sort of forbidden fruit thing. You know, like, oh, my God, you know, it's like you said, the cookie's in the fridge. And yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm a big fan of, like, if you're on a hard diet, don't bring it home, bro. Oh, no. Don't, don't buy it. <laughs> you know? It will get eaten. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing that's helped us, like, telling my kids about it and my wife and stuff is us having livestock like they will just eat if you give them access to food they will eat um, and you know it's just explaining that, you know, we're not that different you know <laughs> literally the goal in their life especially a wild animal is like literally eat and procreate that's it mm-hmm. you know that's that's their two main things they're looking to do every freaking day and uh you know we've changed our life you know as far as the human species in general, where we have access to it. At one point we didn't, you know, and it's, we're hired, we're, we're still wired that way. Yeah. You know, so it would be very easy for everybody to be obese, which we're seeing, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which they are. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like they are. They all have access and their <laughs> body's telling them, eat, 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 and then they're doing it. They're listening. So. <laughs> Yeah. And on the flip side, you can argue that, what is it, I think it's around 700,000 calories the average person consumes over a year. I could be wrong on that, but it's somewhere around that amount. And you're literally, even in the case of people who become obese, you're literally off by like less than a percentage. Yeah. You know, So even with everything going on and the way that your body is wired, it's amazing to me that people aren't actually fatter than, <laughs> than oh, what they are. Yeah. yeah. You know what I think a lot of it is, is I once... I think it was in like one of these business guru books, God, 20 years ago. But he said something, one of those gold nuggets, you know, that you skim through those things for. And it was, listen, if you want to know you're progressing, that means you're slightly uncomfortable. Like, that's kind of the point. You know, it's like the overload principle in training. If you're not asking the body to do something different, why would it change? Yeah. You know, so a little bit of discomfort, I think we're all saying is part of the game. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be yeah. freaking miserable, but yeah. Anyways, we went off on a whole different tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what what else you got there? Uh, yeah, we got. I'm gonna butcher this name because I'm freaking from America. But uh, Sebastian Forget. It's probably for gay or something. I don't know. But uh, I'm missing. Am I missing something for a non powerlifter competitor? Um, am I missing something in regards to power strength if I only use the safety squat bar and trap bar for squats and deadlifts? I'm going to stop there because he's got multiple questions and they all kind of change. Um, so is he missing something for a non powerlifting competitor if he's only using the safety squat bar and the trap bar for squats and deadlifts? You guys want me to start? Or? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'd say the safety squat bar, no. Um, if anything, in my opinion, the safety squat bar is harder. And I have never seen somebody do a long run, let's say 12 weeks with a safety squat bar and then go back to a regular bar. It's always easier. Um, their, their regular squat usually goes up dramatically Interesting. in comparison. So I'd say it's harder because the damn thing tries to fold you. Um, it's purposely trying to just crush your you know, upper back and yeah. fold you over. So you go back to a regular bar and it always seems easy. Um, I am not a trap bar hater. I think it's a good lift. Um, I think you would be potentially missing something. Um, you're not getting any pure hip hinge movement uh, if you're just doing trap bar and safety squat bar. They are a lot the same. It's literally kind of like a squat that's in your hands. Um, but I mean, that's not saying you need a deadlift. You could add in something simple: good morning swings, freaking reverse hyper extensions. Add in some kind of volume for a pure hip hinge move and. 
you're probably okay. I mean, I don't think I'm definitely not one of those people that, especially for a non-power athlete, like you have to deadlift with a straight bar. There's 700 different ways to get the job done. So, um, I would just have urge that person. I have people that can only trap bar deadlift. Um, get some kind of volume in, and it can be light in a, in a hip hinge move, in my opinion. Would you do like RDLs then, Phil, with the straight? Yeah, bar? yeah, RDLs or kettlebell swings or good yeah. mornings or just anything, whatever works for that person. I mean, that's I deal with people that are like me that have been just wrecked in life, and we got to get creative, <laughs> you know. So, and that's that's real life. So, and sometimes it's super light. I mean, especially this guy's not being a powerlifter, so it doesn't matter if he can deadlift six hundred pounds. But uh, I would say, you know, the hip hinge move, if we can find a way to do it, is an important move. Uh, we do it because I've argued it on the show here. I mean, there's that whole argument about what's more important, a deadlift or a, or a squat. And uh, I still stand on it for the average, regular, everyday life. A deadlift's more applicable to real life yeah. because there's, there's time, there's uh, every single day I need to bend over and pick something up. It's not often something falls on my back and I decide to sit down and stand up with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah, utility. So, yeah, as far as utility goes, deadlifts are it, it is a part of everyday life. I mean, Amazon delivers something. I need to pick that up. You know, so um, I really like a, a pure hip hinge move for for everyday people, but it doesn't mean that we have to do it with a straight bar. So. It's actually a good point, Phil, because I mean. I've always cited, I think a lot of people know that, I think squat is like the king of exercises. But for me, it's the it's the risk in a way. Like yeah. when you have that much weight on your back, you are flirting with catastrophe. Oh, yes, you are. And and that's got that takes a lot of courage. And I think that's kind of what, what I liked about it. Whereas a deadlift, you could just like, you get it six inches off the ground. You're like, oh, screw it, drop it, you know. Yep, yep. Um, and that kind of thing. So I think it's, um, but I, it, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say though that the squat has equal daily utility <laughs> to a deadlift. Yes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean I also argue the opposite. You know, in my opinion, it's harder like it's really easy for me to go to a six or seven hundred pound squat and be like mentally like I have to get this. Because if I don't get it, I'm crushed. <laughs> Whereas with a deadlift, it's real easy to give up. So you got you have to want to deadlift big. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you have to want it, like, because it's so easy to oh, just stop, just let go, and it's all over. And if I just let go on a squat, yeah, it's all over in a bad way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, um, depends on how you look at it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. that so, little siren song in the back of your head with the deadlift. Just drop it, bro. Yeah, yeah just, just let go. You won't <laughs> do it. It'll, you'll be fine if you just let go. <laughs> it's like, oh. you know, I've never really. Oh. I know this. I know a lot of our listeners are cringe, but I've never really deadlifted heavy you know i kind of do utility work with deadlifts you know but even to this day maybe 315 i do, i know that's not even grown ass man numbers for you Phil, but that's yeah. just i you know my back is screwy and i don't i would never forgive myself if i blew it out or something mm -hmm. but um no but i get it i was going to ask mike about that because mike you're always experimenting with different shaped bars and stances yeah. and all that stuff i mean what do you think about that I agree with Phil. I mean, I think it's fine. <clears throat> I mean, I I love the safety squat bar. I've I I actually don't think a lot of people <clears throat> should necessarily back squat just because I don't think they have the mobility to do it, especially in the shoulders, which people mm -hmm. forget about. Yeah, you can't get a lot of external rotation. Like yeah. your lower spine is going to be just super cranked to even try to get to a position. Mm -hmm. And again, he's not going to be a power lifter, right? Yeah, so, so it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, safety squat bar, I love having the handles in front. You can kind of keep the bottom part of the rib closer to the pelvis so you don't look like you've got a big kink in your back. Um, it, it, as you get heavier, it, like Phil said, it feels like someone stood on the back of your face and was trying to push it into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which feels just horrible. But for someone like me, where my upper back is probably more of a weakness, then mm -hmm. it's definitely helpful. Yeah. Um, I love trap bar. I think it's great. I mean, especially for most people... If you said, okay, you got two lifts and your goal is to get the maximum load you can get with someone who walked in off the street and you've got two weeks, I would do safety squat bar and a trap bar. Mm -hmm. um, I do agree with Phil, though, that if you want to go to the next level down, 
some more hingy, hamstringy type stuff, I think is probably better. Like I'll just have new kettlebell swings. Yeah. I and mean, that's kind of my, my go to. And uh, yeah, so I think it's good. I mean, you could add a little bit more things to it, but I think overall you're going to be pretty darn close. Right. Yeah, on. Let's be honest. I mean, he's he's light years ahead of most gym bros. He's, oh God, he, yeah. he's squatting and deadlifting <laughs> in some form. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, if you just said, "Can I get away with leg extensions and leg curls?" Then I'd be like, "Oh, bro, come on." <laughs> uh, so, um, okay. Same question in regard to hypertrophy. Am I missing something if I don't do direct ab work, but I overhead press, squat, and deadlift? Hmm. <laughs> Um, what do you? I, as far as I'm trying to take this from the regards to his, as far as hypertrophy goes, probably not. I mean, as far as the strength athlete goes, I would argue yes. Um, like, I think all strength athletes need to do ab work, um, and it's usually a lot heavier. I think people mess up and they they think ab work, and they're just thinking, especially as far as strength athletes goes, a thousand sit ups ain't gonna do it. You know, a thousand sit ups isn't going to make you squat a thousand pounds. Mm-hmm. So we'll do a lot of heavy ab work. Um, it's just like any other muscle group. We're trying to get it to do what, you know, the job at hand. But I think as far as hypertrophy, yeah, I mean, just do that stuff and diet and you're going to look good. So, <laughs> yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a good point about the diet thing. I mean, if you want to, if you want to see your abs, and let's face it, I've seen some people that carried quite a bit of body fat, and if their abs are real thick, you can still see them peeking yeah. under there, you know. But it's a good point because what we were just talking about, like he's way ahead of the game by doing stuff like squats and deadlifts and stuff. These are compound, multi joint movements. They require postural support, you know, and control, and all that kind of stuff. I'm always going to be a fan, though of stuff like I would always just put it again think it's a difference with bodybuilding right bodybuilders aren't they're not going to use typically real heavy weights unless you see somebody occasionally doing the heavy like uh you know cable crunches or something on their knees but um I always like things like v-sits because they they require a lot of sort of uh, just control you know accessory muscle control and stuff <laughs> like that it's actually hard to coordinate bringing your feet up and your chest up in a in an extreme v shape you know, yeah. um, sort of balanced on your butt if people aren't familiar. Because we used to do that in Taekwondo, and then I, I always just did it afterwards because I can crank out, you know, you do even just 25 or 50 of those, and you're like, okay, I just feel like, you know, it's not just the rectus abdominis. You're getting some other stuff. I, I always try to do some twisting movements and stuff like that, but that's an interesting difference in perspective too, Phil, because, you yeah. know, a power lifter is going to want to get thick and strong all the way down through, you know, their yeah. obliques and every layer of the abdominals and all that stuff. Yeah, we end up doing a lot of side bends and a lot of things like that, whereas like if I had a person that's a mainly interested in physique changes, maybe I'm not going to do that because they are going to get thicker at the waist. You know, if you're looking for that mm-hmm. hourglass figure, maybe we don't need to be doing 250-pound side bends. Yeah. You know, um, and then for, again, at the strength athlete thing, that's I'm not a big into frequency like high frequency stuff, but ab work is one of them that I am. Um, I just have people do a little bit every day. Yep. Um, cause it's easier that way. And also I don't, I just don't like if we've tried like, okay, this day we're going to do a ton of abs, no matter what days next you suffer. Um, yeah. you realize, Oh, I do use my abs benching, you know, and things like that. But, uh, and we do a lot of static ab work. Um, meaning if you look at the, your core, if you will, Right. Honestly, it's not designed to create movement. It's not designed to do a crunch. It's yeah. designed to hold ground against the load mm-hmm. in strength sports, at least. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the job we're asking you to do is don't move. Right. So stable. We try and train it that way. We try to stabilize you like, OK, you're going to hold yourself against this load. Um, so we'll do a lot of training in that way. Uh, and I think even loaded carries are great for that. For, oh, yeah. for forward work, yeah. you know, doing yoke walks, farmers walks, things like that, just holding your body in position against a load that's trying to move you. Yeah. So even overhead pressing, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Just oh yeah. Huge amount of core involvement. Yeah. Yep. What do you think, Mike? I mean, you're the you're the anatomist among us. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, spinal flexion versus you know stability things like planks or uh, carries or whatever. Yeah, I mean, if I guess if you would have asked a couple of years ago, I'd probably have a different answer. Like now, 
I think it depends on is your goal a power lifter, a physique athlete, or are you trying to be, uh, mm-hmm. let's say, a sport athlete? Yeah. And I think those, to me, are all kind of different. <clears throat> if you're more on the physique side, I, I don't care as much how your core fires. I mean, I do, but I'm probably not going to convince you of that. And you're probably going to want to do some direct ab work. So I'm probably just going to give it to you. <laughs> I don't think it's going to make or break you. If it's uh, power lifting, and especially if it's a sport athlete, I get really, I guess, concerned about the cueing that we use. Um, and I saw this from Cal Dietz, who said, you know, if you're a 200-meter runner, you're not just solely contracting your abdominals the whole time. You're going to run like crap. So in the gym, I'm looking to see, does your abs, your whole core, does it reflexively fire the way that it should without me cueing you into holding super high pressure? Because that's what I want when you're doing your sport. Now, you could argue if you're powerlifting, that may be different. You're just trying to get maybe maximum amount of tension, however you can get it, because you're just going up and down. You're not worried much about transfer to sport. Um, and so with that, even with a lot of uh, just standard clients, like Phil said, I like using a lot of offset, taking away compensations. So one of my favorites is sit on the ground, spread your feet out 45 degrees, take a kettlebell or dumbbell in one hand and press it overhead. Mm-hmm. And you will... you. If you get too heavy, you can't do it, right? So it's automatically, for online stuff, limiting because you just can't lean back so much because we took your leverage away. And on the opposite side, you'll feel a ton of muscle just reflexively fire in order for you to perform the lift because otherwise you just topple over. Um, So stuff like that, maybe Turkish get-ups. People can kind of cheat their way through that a little bit. Um, Offset, like like Phil was saying, farmer's walks are great. Uh, One-sided farmer's walks are really good. Um, you got to watch out. The load is much higher than you think because you're only loading one side. If you've got someone who's got some tweaky back stuff, start super, super light. Um, even stuff like overhead pressing, if you only have a bar, you're like, hey, I don't have dumbbells or kettlebells. You can do what's called a lever press. But don't put your hands on it symmetric. Take like your right hand, move it all the way to the collar, and then move your left hand somewhere in between. So now you've got this long lever arm hanging out on your left side mm-hmm. and when you press overhead you reflexively have to contract that whole opposite side even just to to do it mm-hmm. so i'm a big fan of kind of goofy ass looking exercises like that yeah yeah to me that's that almost defines your outlook like it, yeah. it, it meshes with your engineering <laughs> brain to me you know like yeah. you're gonna in, invent things if you need them <laughs> yeah yeah and then you just because over time you're like okay here's the output i want I'm not standing there with the athlete to cue them or to watch what compensation methods they're doing. Therefore, I'm kind of limited to, unless they're here in person, what is the thing I can get them to do that will kind of auto-correct and will get the thing that I want just by having them perform the exercise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and then like you stated, I mean, it also depends on what you're doing. Like when I moved and started throwing more, I was like, oh, crap. I need to be able to rotate at the trunk. You know? Right. And I just spent 20 years learning how to not move at the trunk. So I had to do a ton of that, you know, just learning how to how to be able to rotate my shoulders without my hips going with them. You know, so rotate mm-hmm. through the spine. Uh, mm-hmm. and yeah, and then get strong there. So you know, that's yeah, a good point. One of the things I've done over the years, even when I was just interested in physique, um, is I would just get an Olympic bar and just do standing trunk twists just to get some mm-hmm. kind of rotation movement. Yep. Um, you might think, oh my God, you know, you're build up your obliques, but at some point you got to let that go, man. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. it actually robbed me of a decade of deadlifting because I thought I'm going to get so thick to the waist. I'm just, oh, that's yeah. not true. You know, I was wearing 28 inch waist jeans. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> foolish. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, we got to take it real. Uh, you know what? Listen, we're at the point we're at, let's go to break real quick, and we'll come back and, and mop up any um, question and then run some news. Okay. okay. Yep. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto. 
I don't do it because, I mean, look at me, come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text the uh, Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it, do it now! Okay, listeners, after more than a decade of joining us on the podcast Airwaves, you can now also become viewers on YouTube. This is not our usual simple backup of the audio show, but rather a growing body of video taste tests covering various foods of interest to nutrition enthusiasts, bodybuilders, and powerlifters. From within YouTube, simply search for Iron Radio Taste Test or Nutrition Radio Taste Test, in about 15 minutes, we cover taste and texture, similar to other products, uh, usefulness to the co-hosts, and whether we would recommend the product to certain clients. You may even want to watch our podcast feed or Facebook group for which products are coming down the pike so you can taste test them with us. Join us for this new monthly project. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. <laughs> Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, we're back, and we've got one more part to Sebastian's question, and it's, am I missing something if I, do, if I don't do direct arm work, but I do heavy rolling, pulling, and benching? Uh, I think we've touched on this a hundred times, but I mean, again, it's going to come back to, to what, what are you trying to do? But in general, for the general person, no. I mean, honestly, you're probably ahead of the game if you're just doing tons of rowing, pulling, yeah. and benching. <laughs> So, uh, again, we will do it as strength athletes. Usually, I'm going to ID that as a weakness, you know, and like, oh, yeah, your bench sucks because your triceps are weak. So, of course, we're going to do more tricep work. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to do curls and stuff as an afterthought just because we know it helps stabilize the bench and things like that. Um, but we don't do a ton. Now, if you're a physique athlete, yeah, you better do a lot. Because people are looking at your arms, you know, like for us, it doesn't, for strength athletes, the, the whole look is secondary. Yeah. To side effect. Performance. Yeah. Yeah. It's a side effect. So, I mean, like, I honestly don't care if I can curl, you know, but if, if I do a, if my arms are looking rocked, it doesn't matter as long as I can bench 500 pounds. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it, yes and no, it depends. But I mean, I'd say most likely, as far as if I'm taking your question as just a general, you're looking to generally be in shape. No, you're probably doing the right thing by just doing lots of heavy pulling and rows and benches. Yeah. So I personally. And if you can bench 500, you probably don't have twigs for arms anyway. Exactly. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like I, that whole thing going around for a while. Dan John was saying it like, you want big arms, try squatting 800 pounds. And. Well, squats have nothing to do. Yeah, but just by the product of just being a huge mammal, you're going to have big arms. Right. <laughs> <You> yeah. <know>? All <laughs> the other work it takes to get there. Yeah, exactly. It's I still like the squat is direct. Actually get you there, but... Yeah, I I would think even if you're doing those things, um, most people, if they're interested in big arms at all, I do think some direct work is probably handy. Mm -hmm. You know, the funny thing is you're not going to handle the real heavy loads necessarily, right? You're actually probably putting more tension on them with the compound movements and stuff. But yep. I, we were just talking about how um, we, I think we all agree, whether it's in the literature or not, 
smaller muscles recover a little f faster, you know, so yeah. maybe two days later, you know, so maybe you do your, your uh, bent rows or whatever that's obviously going to engage your biceps and your brachialis and stuff, and then maybe two, two three days later, you're doing some direct standing barbell work or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I do like that. And I always just found for me that benching was not enough. Now, again, I never benched heavy, right? Because for me, it was the yeah. opposite, right? Strength is a side effect of the, the size I was after. Yes. So, uh, but at least for me, I if I didn't do lying triceps extensions, I just, maybe it's just anatomical weirdness on me, but that was like the squat of the upper arm. Like my triceps would grow like crazy and I wasn't going to get anything similar to that with benching and and yeah. other things, you know. But again, that that has its its cost and its price too on your elbows. But yeah, and for us as strength athletes, I'd, I'd say it more comes down to uh, tendon and joint health. Yeah, is what we do direct yeah, arm yeah. work for. So well, there's little doubt that I absolutely effed my triceps, you know, tendons, tendonitis re recurring over mm -hmm. decades, leading to tendinosis and then a rupture. Not cool, you know. So yeah, yeah. Mike. Um, it sounds like you're not a huge fan of direct arm work, but a lot of your people, if they're just fitness figure physique, obviously you're going to suggest some favorites or something, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just go off of what are, you know, what are their goals? Um, so one guy I worked with, he sent me a nice comment the other day that people were commenting that his arms were bigger, so he's all excited about that, which is awesome, you know, because that was when he, you know, was competed in shows before, and that was one of his things he wanted to work on. So great, mm -hmm. awesome. You know, we also had him do a fair amount of rowing on the concept, too, and other movements that he wasn't used to also. Um, so that was probably helpful for that, too. And he's already, like, super lean, so it makes it easier, too. So, yeah, it just depends on what their goals are and what they're trying to do. Um, I do include some grip work in most people's stuff, which is kind of indirect arm work in a roundabout sort of way, just because I find it's super weak <laughs> on most people. Kind of like what Phil said with the ab stuff, just adding a little bit here and there makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it just you know, goes back to what are your goals. It's probably going to be somewhat in there, even if they're not trying to prioritize any arm work, just from a general health uh, joint stability. I'm a big fan of higher rep press downs, things of that nature, just get some more blood flow into the kind of avascular tissue. And yeah, I actually started doing a little bit more arm work again myself i'm training my buddy dr tommy wood for a strongman competition and he was giving me a bad time so i said okay i'll do your little experiment of doing some blood flow restriction <laughs> stuff on my off days for for arms and oh, see how it goes that's interesting yeah you'll have to tell yeah. us what happens yeah 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 i'm on uh, week two right now <laughs> curls for the girls dr nelson yeah. Yeah, it is fun to get an arm pump. I mean, you know, you talked yeah, about. Yeah, I forgot how much I suck at that, it's... especially for muscle restriction. <laughs> yeah, holy yeah. crap, that's painful. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but as far as the motivation part, I mean, um, let's face it. I mean, it depends on what your favorite body part is. But there's not a bodybuilder around who wouldn't like to hear something about, "Hey, man, you know, that's a, that's you're pretty strong, you know, or or yeah. Phil, like, dude, your back is huge." You, yeah. It's. You, we could say it's secondary, but it's still a motivator, you know, like yeah, people oh, are making totally. comments. Not always just arms, right? It depends on your favorite body part, I think. But yeah. The hard one for me, though, with any of this not big compound move work is literally I'm just addicted to hip, lifting heavy stuff. Like I'm never going to get the feeling <laughs> of, you know, I'm not going to crank on Slayer at volume number 97 and fuck, get myself all worked up to do a curl. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's never gonna be the same. Right, like you get the adrenaline going, like I'm about to do this. Yeah, and everybody's screaming, like you got this shit. <laughs> and and I, it's not the same. So it's you know, that's the, I'm an adrenaline junkie in that way, and I've realized it. And like I will always squat and deadlift heavy as long as I can, just because I love the event of it. Yes, the event. Um, and curling is not an event. Right. <laughs> you know? Neither is ab work, right? But, ab work. Yeah, but like it's, but it's necessary. <laughs> you know, it's just eh, just do it. You know? Right. And that's I'll turn on some oldies and pump out some arm work. You know? Yeah. So Yeah. Because it's gonna help that event. Right, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but well, that's yeah. why they say accessory, I imagine. You know, this is oh. it's not the main event. Yeah. Which to, to me is always fascinating what people are into and everybody is wired completely different 
Yeah. You know, it, it, like to me, even with grip stuff, like it, doing a Saxon bar or an axle or stuff that's more heavily loaded to me is just a lot more interesting. Mm-hmm. But you've got people that will do a coin lift, which is you're literally pinch gripping the end of like half a penny and you're measuring differences in like half a pound. Yeah. And to them, that's like the most exciting thing on the face of the planet. <laughs> hey, that's cool. You know, it's just everyone's into their own thing, which is great. Yeah. Right. Yes, it is. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah, that's totally fine. Yep. <laughs> it's, just, yep. it's just amazing to me how different it is. Or you go to an Olympic weightlifter who's just lifting in silence. Oh, yeah. You go to a powerlifting thing where it's like Slayer on blast, you know? <laughs> well, even, yeah, even among subsets, like in Empower, yeah. there are people that love to bench. I freaking hate it, and I always have, and it's the most boring lift in the world. But I understand there's people that love it, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know, you guys, this is what um, enthuses me about muscle sports in general, right? Because unlike running, which is guess what, you run. I mean, I know I, there's going to be people there who totally lay into me for that. Like, there's so much skill, and there's this and that. Okay, fine, but. There's such a massive variety of things that you can decide is your thing uh, in power and muscle sports. You know, is it chest work? Is it a bench press? Is it is it a body part? Is it grip stuff? I mean, there's just so much variety, and it's really a chance for almost anybody to find something they're good at. Yes, I think you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And my buddy Adam reminds me of this all the time too. It's like if. If you just practice the specific things that you need to get better at and you put in the time over years and decades and you do it with, you know, halfway intelligent manner, you're you're going to get better and you probably will end up being pretty good at it. Doesn't mean you're going to win world competitions, but you're definitely going to be much farther ahead. And with the Internet and everything now, I sound like some ranting old man, but I just see people changing what they want to do every so often, mm-hmm. which is fine if that's what you really want to do is something different. But I just wonder how, I don't know, like how much they would be better at just kind of picking one general direction and just spending a few years kind of going that direction to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, you guys, I'm going to cut this to two um, papers uh, just because we were kind of tangenting earlier. Strength and Muscle Sport News. Um, neither of these things are that surprising. This is going to be the kind of stuff where Phil's like, uh, we already know that. <laughs> but <laughs> but science is going to record things and move on and things like that. So this first one is – honestly, I was interested in the artificial sweetener side of this uh, as far as beverages go. But this is the association of consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages or artificially sweetened beverages with mortality – so it's a big systematic review, uh, meta-analysis. It says sugar-sweetened beverages and artificially sweetened beverages uh, have been reported to be associated with mortality. Uh, but the conclusions mm. were inconsistent. This review looks at evidence on the associations of sugar-sweetened and artificially sweetened intakes with mortality from all causes, just cardiovascular disease, or just cancer. Uh, and, you know, you hear this quite a bit with people, you know, like, oh, so-and-so... Uh, like uh, a few years ago, I had a student who had a relative, just lived on diet pop, you know, ends up, one of his relatives ends up with, I think it was pancreatic cancer or something. And it, it makes you wonder about these associations. I mean, it's not causal, of course, but here they had 15 studies, uh, including 17 cohort studies, uh, each serving, so 12 fluid ounces, 355 cc's. Uh, increased daily uh, sugar-sweetened beverage consumption was associated with higher risk of all-cause mortality. But when you look at the hazard ratio, it's 1.08. So, <laughs> meh, you know. Um, yeah. it, like any increase in overall death is not cool. Don't get me wrong. But um, the associations of artificially sweetened intakes with all-cause and cardiovascular mortality were J-shaped. Um, so here, Mike, sort of almost suggesting like what you're saying, er- everything is not freaking linear, right? But, yeah, um, nothing's linear. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, so it, this says uh, hazard ratio across different doses. So j shape suggesting, you know, radically higher intakes are going to really screw you. Uh, but that got up to, let's see, across different doses. 
1.13 was the hazard ratio, it looks like, for all-cause mortality. Uh, and uh, 1.25 for cardiovascular mortality. It says no significant association was found for cancer, for cancer mortalities. Mm. So that's interesting to me. They're linking it more strongly with cardiovascular than with cancer. Because, you know, there's you, you hear about stuff like the caramel colors, and there are a lot of things in, like, colas and stuff. Uh, so much so that I was on a quest earlier this year for uncolored cola, you know. Um, not that I drink a ton of it, but I was getting kind of weirded out by all that caramel color stuff. It says, in summary, higher sugar-sweetened beverage and artificial sweetened beverage intakes were associated with higher risk of all-cause mortality and CVD mortality. Uh, but, of course, the evidence is limited. So I guess just don't, you know, they're talking about how many doses 12 ounce doses you get throughout the day zero one one and a half two two and a half servings a day actually they only go up to about two and a half servings a day here and like i said there are definitely people who go way above that you know yeah. living on you know like sipping a diet coke constantly or something so um i also wonder if a lot of the public perception of higher cancer rates with some of those is done off of a lot of the rat studies because Talking to a rat research buddy, or I always get rats and mice mixed up, which they always just give me a 10-minute lecture about it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're super prone to cancer, I guess, compared to humans. So there's been a lot of questions more recently about is that the best model for cancer and what type of cancer and everything else, too. So Interesting. But it looks like some of the human trials that we have come out at least from things that we think are carcinogenic that are kind of on the fence like diet pop uh artificial flavors it's, it's super mixed in humans and again it's again very very limited data and i'm not a cancer researcher but it doesn't make you wonder right well i certainly saw that in the some of the different dietary lipids you know my dissertation yep. on cla it does CLA. wondrous things to mice they lose half their body fat in a matter of a yep. several weeks and humans barely respond you know yep yep um one last one while we wind down the show here because we're just about out of time Ultra-processed food and the risk of overweight and obesity, a systematic review and meta-analysis of observational studies. So it says numerous studies have reported the association of ultra-processed foods with excess body weight. Um, but again, they wanted to do a systematic review and sort of modernize this. This is brand new stuff from Ascari, A-S-K-A-R-I and colleagues, uh, International Journal of Obesity. So they did a literature search across the major databases, and those of you who are science-y, you know, you know, National Library of Medicine, like PubMed, Cochrane, uh, there's several ones that they go to, all legitimate. Um, results, 14 studies, which included one cohort study and 13 cross-sectional studies, were included in the review. A significant association was identified between ultra-processed food intake and being overweight. 1.02 for the effect size. Uh, and for obesity, the effect size pooled was 1.26. So not surprising. Like I said, Phil's just going to be like, well, yeah, okay, don't live on ultra-processed foods. Uh, you know, eat oatmeal instead of Twinkies. You know, um, It says our findings reveal a positive association between ultra-processed foods and excess body weight. Future studies with longitudinal designs and adequate controls should be included. Well, again, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that shocked me is in their intro here, they define ultra processed foods. And this is kind of disturbing. Ultra processed foods are often re referred to as entirely industrially manufactured as quote unquote ready to eat or ready to heat preparations that include additives and minimal whole foods. My God. So there's like yeah. no real food in them. Uh, Okay, you know, but if, if that's where <laughs> we're at, you know, like think about your grandparents. If you tried to explain what you ate, they'd be like, if you said, you know, people don't eat fruits and vegetables, he'd be like, well, what the hell, what's food then? Like, what the hell do you eat if you don't eat fruits and vegetables and meats, you know? Um, it says the impact of ultra processed food on several lifestyle related diseases has been established, including diabetes, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and cancer previously demonstrated. So, I don't know. We live in a freaky time, my friends, because that's um, – we're eating non-food items, apparently. <laughs> this is what make this, this makes, yeah. makes it sound like, you know. Um, 
in what universe do you ever think that's a good idea? Like how much harm it causes is a different question, but yeah, it's like, how do we get here? <laughs> no, it's right. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm actually a big believer and I know all of us are on some level. I think Michelle has said this before, Phil, you've said this before, but if you just ate unprocessed foods, like stuff that you can identify on a farm or on a nature walk or something like that, mm-hmm. you're, it's, it's going to be real hard to become the giant, morbidly obese person that we see so yeah. commonly now. It's going to be really yeah. hard to do that. Yeah. All right, guys. I got to step out. All right. Well, we're done. It's time so, to go squat. Right on. Everybody have a good day. All right. Have fun, you guys. See you later. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.